Welcome, my name is Dave Rosenblum. This is a basic course for ultrasound guided pain procedures. We're going to focus on the basics in this lecture series, followed by soft tissue injections, including tendons, joints, and bursa, trigger points, nerve blocks, more complex neuraxial procedures such as caudal epidurals, facet joints, and many more. In this basic set, we're going to go over the principles of ultrasound, how it works, and techniques to maximize visibility and success for your procedures. If you're interested in preparing for the boards, please check out our website. We have a newsletter that you can subscribe to that, that has lots of updates to our events, discounts on the website, as well as free practice management materials. So ultrasound is a high frequency sound generated in specific frequency ranges sent through tissues. The signal bounces back to the transducer and is interpreted. The waves are in the range of 20,000 cycles or kilohertz per second, and it's not audible to the human ear. Clinically, it's in the megahertz range. Human ear sensitivity is from 20 to 20,000 hertz. Diagnostic ultrasound typically ranges from 2.6 to 14 megahertz. Penetration is largely based on the frequencies produced. Lower frequencies, such as 2 MHz, will penetrate deeper than higher frequencies. Sound is, either, sound is either absorbed, reflected, or allowed to pass through the tissue, depending on the density. This is termed echo density of the tissue. The transducer sends and receives the reflection of sound, and time is measured since the velocity is known. Distance can then be plotted. Brightness equals the amount of reflection and acoustic characteristic of the tissue. The ultrasound machine uses a piezoelectric crystal to listen for the reflections or echoes of the sound as it passes information back to the transducer. Time between sending and receiving equals distance. The amount of energy, the amount of energy reflected not absorbed or propagated will equal density. Echolucent, this is termed for substances that are containing a lot of water and are very good conductors of sound and reflect the light and they appear dark. Substances which contain little water such as bone or air reflect almost all energy and they appear very bright on the machine. Image resolution. It can be enhanced with compound imaging. Multiple lines of crystals of the transducer emit and receive ultrasound in multiple planes, and this is before the display of the images. It's electronically reconstructed. Color Doppler is another technique that is useful to help differentiate vascular tissue from other tissues that you are scanning. When it comes to probes, there are many different types. Low frequency probes are typically in the range of 3 to 5 kilohertz, and they're typically useful for scanning the deeper organs such as the kidney, gallbladder, liver. Scanning superficial structures such as nerves of the brachial plexus may require a higher frequency probe such as that in the range of 10 to 15 kilohertz. Scanning superficial structures such as the brachial plexus may require a higher range probe, such as those in the range of 10 to 15 megahertz. It can provide adequate resolution, however, the beam may only penetrate 3 to 4 centimeters in depth. Here's an example of a high frequency probe. Here's a low frequency probe. Disadvantages to the nerve stimulator technique, which has been used in the past, include the fact that the nerve stimulator settings have no consistent relationship to the proximity of the nerve. Neuropathy can render the nerve stimulator almost worthless. Other peripheral and more essential neuropathic conditions, such as toxic neuropathies from chemotherapy or radiation, demyelinating conditions, multiple sclerosis, and even possible Advanced age commute the response to the nerve stimulator.
therefore return electrode placement or barriers to the current return may actually impair the ability to get adequate response from the nerve stimulator. In addition, if there is a piece of tissue between your needle tip and the targeted structure, the electrical signals may pass. However, the actual local anesthetic you're injecting may not pass, and therefore, it may not be ideal to rely only on a nerve stimulator. The scanning position. Patient positioning for each block is very important. It can reduce the distance between the skin and your target, as well as optimize structures or fixate structures. In many cases, it's the same for non-image guided techniques. Of course, sterile techniques should be used, especially when placing a continuous catheter for various regions, such as local anesthetic for a operative procedure. And the conducting gel should be sterile as well. I'd like to take a moment to discuss how I trained and how things were done when I started back in 2003. When I was a resident in anesthesiology, we relied either on the twitch monitor for many of these blocks, as well as the paresthesia technique. Paresthesia technique, for, for instance, for the interscaling block was done all the time, and you're basically sticking a blunt needle into the patient until the patient feels a paresthesia in the, in the, in the location of the brachial plexus. Of course, this is not always ideal, and it's not comfortable for the patient, and may predispose the patient to nerve injury. As a result, I noticed at NYU's Bellevue, we had one attending who was using the ultrasound, and I started to pay more attention to his techniques and apply them to the interscaling techniques. With the ultrasound, I found less of a need to rely on the twitch monitor and a very high success rate, and, and this has been supported in a lot of the literature. Now, scanning technique is very important. First of all, you have a transverse and a longitudinal way of scanning the probe. The transverse is to go in the same plane as the nerve. The transverse approach, in the transverse approach, the nerves will actually appear more rounded or oval shaped. You're cross-sectioning the nerve and you may actually see the fascicles of the nerves inside the bundles. The longitudinal view is the long view in which you're going along the nerve and you're going to see a linear pattern of hyperechoic fascicular components with bands corresponding to the interfascicular, corresponding to the interfascicular epineurium. The picture here is actually a longitudinal image of picture here is actually a transverse image of the sciatic nerve. It's almost a cross section of the nerve in which it appears oval and you could see one side of the picture is medial and the other side is lateral with the corresponding musculature above it. Nerves also have different degrees of echogenicity. There's different appearances to the nerves. For instance, the brachial plexus in this picture is not hyperechoic. It's actually hypoechoic. Unlike the sciatic nerve in the previous image, which is hyperechoic, you notice the nerve is white here, whereas here it is a black structure. Many people will actually compare it to the appearance of grapes because it's a bunch of circles. And this is very typical of the trunks and roots of the brachial plexus in the interscalene and supraclavicular region. Now, the nerves do change as you go more distal. They do become more hyperechoic. In the arm, you see the branches of the brachial plexus appear more whitish. So, nebology is a term used to describe the buttons and the functions of the different settings on the ultrasound machine. Attenuation is a term to describe the emitted ultrasound wave amplitude that gets smaller as it penetrates deeper into a tissue. Gain is, the, gain is how the ultrasound machine overcomes attenuation. Time gain compensation increases the amount of gain given to an input signal, and it's a sampling time that increases monotonically. 
it counteracts the excessive sound dampening properties of human tissue. Ordo gain resets the gain to presets for the type of scan being performed. And here's where the ordo gain is located on the ultrasound machine, and this is what it looks like. The previous presets that were programmed are now visible with this image. Dynamic range, it's the difference between the maximum and minimum values of the displayed signal of images to display and determine image quality. Focal zone is a region within the transmitted zone beam in which the beam narrows to its minimum size. The lateral resolution is best in the focal zone. You have various modes. The M mode is the amplitude mode. Signal transducer scans a line through the body with echoes plotted on the screen as a function of depth. Therapeutic, therapeutic ultrasounds can be aimed at tumors or calculus to focus destructive energy. B mode. It's a two-dimensional mode and it stands for brightness. It's created by a linear array of transducers simultaneously scanning a plane. B flow is digitally highlighting weak reflectors such as red blood cells while suppressing surrounding stationary tissues. It's useful for visualizing blood flow and is an alternative or complement to the Doppler ultrasound. M mode obtains an image and imaging the B mode, it displays it graphically as a change over time. It's used in intravascular volume assessment of the IVC, wall movement, cardiac contractility, and evaluation of a pneumothorax. Here's an image of the color Doppler, which is velocity info presented as color coded overlay on top of B mode imaging. The color power Doppler is the amplitude or power of Doppler signals rather than the frequency shift. It's used in detecting blood flow in organs of low flow, flow states, such as the ovaries and testicles for evaluating testicular torsion, for example. Continuous wave Doppler is Info that is sampled along a line through the body and all the velocities detected at each point in intake are presented on a timeline. Pulse wave Doppler or PW Doppler. Info is sampled from only a small sample volume defined in a two-dimensional image presented on a timeline. And you can see here in the picture, we're noting blood flow. Duplex is a common name for the simultaneous presentation of two-dimensional and pulse with info. Triplex is in modern machines when color Doppler is used with it. There's a harmonic mode, which is deep penetrating frequency. The noise and artifacts due to reverberation and aberrations are reduced. And here's how we scan in various planes. This is the sagittal plane on top, which is parallel to the long axis of the body. The midline is called the mid-sagittal region, while the regions to the left and right are the parasagittal region. And coronal, parallel to the long axis of the body, perpendicular to the sagittal plane, separates anterior to posterior. And we're going to use different scanning planes for different procedures. Transverse, here's an axial plane. It's perpendicular to the long axis of the body, and it separates tops from bottom. Oblique is not necessarily at a right angle to the other planes mentioned above. It's how we basically search for a lot of our nerves. We may scan one way or another into the oblique planes. Now some tips for your scanning. My advice is to become ambidextrous. I know it's hard, but when you're dealing with laterality of a procedure, you want to be able to scan one side or the other and get used to using both hands for performing the injection or holding your needle or the probe. If you're new to this, best to start out doing it right away so that you will learn it as you go. And by the time you get used to everything, it will be, it will be a no-brainer. You won't even be thinking about which hand you use. You just do whatever makes sense. You also want to scan back and forth the patient and find the target, practice with a phantom. And in this case, in this picture here, you'll see that my fingers are resting on the patient's tissue on the neck. It's helping to stabilize the actual probe so it doesn't slip and slide. I have my index and thumb holding the probe, but my other fingers are stabilizing the probe against the patient's skin. Another piece of advice is to jiggle the tissue as you are performing your procedure. 
You can place one hand on the needle and the other hand on the probe to stabilize it. And you just jiggle it in and out. As you see here, this is a very deep procedure, which I'm doing with a high frequency probe. So it's hard to see deep down the needle tip. And I use a skinny needle, a 25 gauge needle, because it's less painful for the patient. In a way, I am finding or visualizing my tip by jiggling the needle in and out as I move so that I could see the tissue tent up and then scan towards it. And in the end, I'm using a technique that has the most ideal size needle for the patient, but not the most ideal size needle or ultrasound for visualization. As you see, as, as the needle, as you see, as the imaging goes deeper, it's not as clear. The, the needle is even more visible up top in the screen. And speaking of needles, the advantage to a 25 gauge, one and a half inch needle is that it's very easy to manipulate, but of course it doesn't go very deep and it's sharp. So you can do damage as you enter the tissue. A 25 gauge, three and a half inch needle is actually the needle of choice. It is sharp and it can also potentially do damage. However, I've been using it for many years. I've never had a uh, complication related to this needle and I don't see an advantage to the blunt needle over this one in my current practice. There may be data suggesting otherwise, and especially if you're a beginner, you might want to consider a blunt echogenic needle because you can actually see the needle better and it's blunt in case you don't know where your tip is. If, if you're up against a vital structure such as a nerve or blood vessel, you're less likely to traumatize it. But remember, this is something that goes along with uh, years of practice. It's also very vi difficult to visualize these 25 gauge needles. And I would definitely recommend that the beginners use echogenic needles and practice with phantoms before they actually touch a patient. Thank you for joining us. And there will be more to follow with the soft tissue, basic and more advanced neuraxial lectures in this course.